our next presenter is uh, Fred Hart. Fred Hart is the partner and creative director at Interact Boulder, a branding and packaging design firm that partners solely with food and beverage brands. Fred and Interact are brand mentors to Excel Foods, a New York-based food and beverage incubator, and regularly participate in Boulder, Colorado's natural food movement. Fred's exper beverage experience spans a number of leading and bleeding edge uh, categories, beverage categories, from kombucha to matcha, bone broth, plant-based drinks, to juice, sparkling tea, CSDs, energy drinks, and adult beverages. Uh, Fred's worked with a, s a number of beverage brands, iconic beverage brands over the years, including Monster, Mike's Hard Lemonade, International Delight, Dogfish Head, with more to come. His presentation is entitled Three Keys to Unlocking Potential and is loaded with information that you'll need today and for years to come. Fred Hart. How are you guys doing? Before I get started, would like to just see a show of hands. Who here has a beverage already out in market? Okay. And who of you guys are going plan to put one into market? Don't have it yet. Awesome. It's about half and half. Great. Well, today's title, uh, really corny self-help, but it's gonna it's gonna add up to something. I promise. Is about finding your design partner, amplifying that relationship and giving you guys reasons why you should invest in design. Um, so we'll start a little bit with Interact. Um, as Ray said, we're a branding and packaging design agency, and we work solely with food and beverage companies. Um, our clients are all over the country, and they run, range from small startups to multi-million dollar brands and everything in between. So we get to see and work with a lot of different types of companies, and we found that we work best closely with founders and entrepreneurs. Um, our work is all about creating emotional experiences with consumers. It's about being sales effective. We're not here to win awards. We're here to help amplify your success. Um, and that comes through sales and really building a meaningful brand out in the marketplace. But today is not about Interact. We're here to talk about you guys. And so I want to start off, before we even get into talking about a design partner and investing in that, um, understanding that you guys put more time, money, and effort into the brands that you're building. And you guys take on a lot of risk. I think Bill's presentation was great. Uh, the exploding margarita line sounds like a nightmare and would give most of us heart attacks. And I just want to acknowledge the fact that you guys are risk takers. You guys are challengers and you're innovators. And it's the same reason uh, that Coca-Cola and Pepsi and all of these large CPGs buy emerging brands. It's because you guys know how to innovate. And you guys are the bloodline for this industry. You guys continually push things forward. And it's, you know, it gives people like myself an opportunity to change the world with you. And so we're very thankful for that. And before we talk about design, you need to understand that your experience is going to precede any branding or design that you invest in. And what we mean by that, and what our good friend Ken Sadowski would say, is that it has to be in the bottle. What you put out into the world and the marketplace has to be the best thing possible. If it's not the most refreshing or the most functional or some combination thereof, or really fulfills a need state for a consumer, don't waste your time and money in design. You guys need to put the investment into this first, and then you guys can start thinking about your product. Because your beverage should have me feeling like Steph Curry winning the championship tonight. And instead of dousing myself in champagne, it's got to be kombucha or nut milk or whatever you guys are throwing out there. But that's how you should make a consumer feel. So let's talk about finding your design partner. And I'm going to give you sort of three steps in finding your perfect design partner. First thing you guys should know is that investing in design is sooner, you should do it sooner better than later. Here is a very simplified uh, life cycle of a brand. So you've got a dream. Maybe you can get it into your first stores. About half of you guys are at that stage. Maybe you pick up velocities and you get into regional sales. You might pick up some investment along the way. You could go national. You might become a category leader someday. And soon you'll be on your way to achieving your dreams. But I'm sure as many of you guys can anticipate, or will soon to find out, the process is going to look a lot more cluttered. And it's going to be really difficult for you guys to understand when is the right time for you to invest in design. 
It's a very tough question, and it's going to happen organically. And I'm going to walk you through a couple of case studies of different brands out in the marketplace who invested in design at different types and what it did to their overall trajectory. First one's Vitacoco. I'm sure you guys are all familiar. They started a category onto their own, and the design was actually done by one of the co-founder's wives. Right? It's, it might as well have been done by her second cousin out of college. Someone knew how to um, design. And what they put out into the marketplace had a lot of room for flexibility. Because when you're starting a category, there's room for error. Here's what they look like today. It's a very straightforward evolution. And one thing to keep in mind is when you start a category, you are going to build up equity a lot faster if that category takes hold. So for better or for worse, they were handcuffed to the equities that they started with. Now, their design partner helped polish those things, evolve them. They probably did a lot of work on the positioning of the brand, of the messaging, and more importantly, helped manage their portfolio. They probably have 20 plus SKUs now, and that can be a, a pretty arduous task. And so a design agency um, really helped them elevate their image in the marketplace and continue to keep them established as that category leader. So this is more of an evolutionary role of design and a design partner. This is going to be a little bit more emblematic of what some of you guys will face. And this is one of our clients out of Chicago. They're a pro plant protein company, almond milk based. They're in the Midwest region. They're in 50 stores. It's a great product. What's inside the bottle is phenomenal. And it's high protein. It's low sugar. So it's hitting on a bunch of uh, cylinders right now for the consumers. And what they realized upon taking on investors is that they wanted to get into Whole Foods and regions outside of the Midwest. So they approached us as a design agency and said, we love what's in the bottle. We hate everything else. Help us rethink our presentation to consumers. And here's what they look like today. So through working with us, we did brand workshops. We repositioned them. We gave them a new name. We gave them a new brand identity and new packaging. Now, they went to their regional Whole Foods buyer, and they had their meeting. And mind you, the product is the same from the start to the end. The Whole Foods buyer loved the product and the branding so much that he volunteered to put it on the global wholesale food call. And that means any regional buyer can pick it up. It's going to launch in September in all regions. And this just goes to show you what design can do and help amplify a brand. Now, this is, again, not going to happen every single time that you go through a redesign. But it is showing you that if you don't limit yourselves to the equities that you establish up front, that there is still time for you to get it right and increase your trajectory. Last example is a brand that invested in design at the very onset. And to be honest, this is something that most of you guys can't afford to do. But if there is you know, a couple of you that have that ability, I'd highly suggest it. Now, again, this is a billion dollar brand that we're looking at. And many of you may not know, but Hanson Soda actually created Monster. Now, Hanson's knew that that brand was not appropriate for the energy drink marketplace. And at the time that Monster launched into the category, you already had Red Bull with a 74% market share. You had Pepsi, who had AMP. You had Coca-Cola, who had Full Throttle. You had Anheuser-Busch, who had 360, which doesn't even exist anymore. You had the biggest companies in the world vying for market share. And Hanson Soda invested in design at the early onset and realized that there was an untapped demographic that wasn't being spoken to that this functionality was perfect for. And if you think of energy drinks, the functionality is the exact same. Red Bull, Monster, it's all energy, right? And so it just shows you what getting your branding and design right can help do to your trajectory. So again, if this is sort of where you're at today, one reason you should look for a design partner is so that they can help elevate you. Our second step in sort of finding your design partner is assessing your needs. Now, you guys are all going to need a design partner at some point, unless, of course, you're a designer yourself. But you all should know that you guys are the experts in your brand and your product. No one knows it better than you all. You're going to need a design partner who's an expert in their space. So that comes to uh, how to have a conversation with consumers, how to strategize its shelf, how to bring a perspective and a unique tone of voice to the marketplace. And through that combination and those relationships, you'll find your greatest potential. There are going to be two routes for you guys, freelance designers or maybe an in-house designer and an agency. I'm just going to walk through a couple pros and cons. 
Design freelancer, they're gonna be one person with one perspective, with one set of experience. It's hard to find branding and packaging experts out there. They're probably gonna have web or have done print or just graduated college, and they'll be able to help you paint a picture. But that's about it. And so what you'll get with an agency is multiple perspectives, multiple experiences. You'll get the benefit of a bunch of smart people in a room trying to hash out what your brand should be. Designers are obviously going to be able to design. Now, some of them are gonna be more skilled than others, but what a design agency is gonna to bring to the table is design thinking. The best brands in the world are built on ideas, and design thinking is all about taking a human-centric approach to design and making it resonate with people. And the last thing is cost. Like I said, most of you guys aren't gonna be able to afford to invest in design at the onset. A designer is gonna be much more affordable, they're gonna have less overhead, and they're gonna have less experience as well. A design agency is gonna range from more affordable to less affordable. Um, but obviously, if you were to look at two numbers comparatively, a freelancer's number is gonna look like a short-term investment. It's gonna look like something you can digest right now. A design agency is gonna be a larger number, but it's important that you keep in mind that this is a long-term investment. This isn't a short play. Yves Bahar, uh, creative director of uh, Fuse Project, really smart individual, says, we are not designers of shapes, we're designers of ideas. F most freelancers are just going to be able to design shapes. You want someone that can design ideas. The last thing is get personal. You're gonna be dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis. I showed you a little bit of our work at the beginning, and I'm here to tell you that we're di a dime a dozen. Everyone that you talk to is hopefully gonna have really great work. Right? It's just a matter of what experiences they had. You want the right people that see the world you see it. Some of you guys are crazy. Some of you guys think outside the box. You want someone that shares your vision and then can amplify it. We always like to think of our favorite clients or the people that we want to have drinks with, that we want to hear stories from, that we want to spend time with. Design and investing in design is probably going to be one of the most fruitful and fun experiences because you get to see it come to life visually. You should enjoy the partner that you have with you as you go through that experience. And what I'd recommend to you guys, whether you're talking to a freelancer or an agency, ask for references. Ask them for, to talk to some of their clients that have been in your shoes at one time. It's gonna be a very alien experience for some of you guys. And hearing uh, the, what the process was like and what it did for other young entrepreneurs is gonna help comfort you guys a lot. So let's talk about amplifying that relationship once you've solidified one. The first thing that you guys need to bring to the table is an understanding of yourself. You guys need to know who you are in the world and what your stance is. It's a great Instagram post. You'll see it on every girl's page or maybe a Pinterest, but it's very true. Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. The world does not need another me too. Brands are like people. And people are defined by all of these different attributes. I love playing basketball, I love shoes, I love walking around cities, there are all these things, but when I have three seconds at shelf to tell you what's different about me, I have to pick one thing. You guys need to understand what that one thing about your brand and your product that makes you unique, bring that to the table with your design agency. A good design partner should push you guys and challenge you on is that really the biggest thing to lean into. But at the end of the day, you need to do the homework to understand yourself. This is a great example I like to give. This is in a recent BevNet presentation, or article, excuse me. It's about Rob Gronkowski's new sponsorship with Monster. And Rob is quoted as saying, Monster Energy just fits my personality. The brand is great, and just like Monster, I like beautiful girls too. But what's even better is the VP of Sports Marketing response. He says, Rob perfectly fits into our strategy of signing unique elite athletes. We love what he does in the game, but we also love that he likes to party. Now this is a billion dollar brand that has class action lawsuits and a target on its back, and yet they are unapologetic about who they are in the world. Each and every one of you guys should aspire to that level of confidence. Really speak with a tone of voice, have a perspective in the world. And so once you bring that to the table, it is then going to be your design partner's job to bring that to life in a meaningful way. So I'm gonna walk through two examples with you guys. Lemonade. There is nothing innovative about lemonade. It is sugar, it's water, and it's flavor. That's it. 
And yet, Hubert's Lemonade was able to come into a stodgy category and steal a bunch of market share for itself. And it's because of the perspective that it took on the world. It's a brand about playfulness, tongue in cheek, a little bit quirky, but it's done in a manner that isn't childish, feels comfortable in an adult's hand. And that really resonated with that demographic. Another favorite example, Svelte, protein drink. We're talking about a category that is just abusive and highly masculine and it's just crazy. And this is a brand that knew that it was for a female demographic. But not just that, they were a brand about positivity and optimism. And they decided that through their packaging, they were gonna have a conversation at shelf with the consumer. Looking good, hello beautiful, enjoy yourself. I would love to hear a package tell me that. All right, setting objectives. Second thing you guys need to do to amplify your relationship is understand what you want to achieve. How will you measure success? For some of you guys, it's gonna be getting into Whole Foods. I wanna get into regional Whole Foods, I wanna go national, maybe you wanna get into Target's new incubator program. Understanding where you want to exist is going to help your design partner immensely. Maybe it's stealing market share. You're coming into a crowded category, there's a lot going on, but there's a lot of money being exchanged and you guys wanna take part in that. Understanding who you're trying to take away from is going to be pivotal. One of my favorite examples, if you guys are familiar with uh, the Kraken rum at all, Google it if you're not, their creative brief was kill Captain Morgan. That was what they set out to do. And if you look at their branding against Captain Morgan's, they definitely achieved it. Maybe it's your story that's the most unique thing about you. Maybe it's your founder's story, or the sourcing of your ingredients, or the process in which you make your product. Um, sometimes that can be the most important thing in telling. And maybe that's how you're gonna measure success. Does it tell my story appropriately? And then there are gonna be a few of you guys in the room who want to create a brand new category. And that's gonna be a very challenging experience. But if you can do it, obviously it's gonna be very beneficial. Now we're talking about planting a flag on your, own, on your Mount Everest where no one has ever climbed it before. And that requires a ton of education and it's hard to do for emerging brands. And so letting your agency know ahead of time that that's your goal is going to influence how they approach strategically building your brand. The last thing you guys need to bring to the table is bravery and trust. If you want people to think, give them intent, not instruction. The most harmful thing you can do to your design partner is giving them prescription-based, uh, solution-based feedback and ideas. This is about collaborating. It's not about having someone be your set of hands. If you're gonna do that, don't waste your time and money. It's not gonna work out. The, it's all about collaboration. So here's an example of a brand that came in with a very brave uh, view on the world. Now, this is Blueprint. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but here's what the category looked like when they entered it. Now, they started the premium juice category, but when they first launched, you're talking about Naked and Edwalla and all these very conventional looking brands. And they knew that through the process that they were either cold pressing or HPP in their juices, that they were truly different and that they stood for purity and transparency as a company. And what better way to tell that story than visually unpack? Now, it takes some balls to do something like this but it has a huge influence on the market as a result. If you look at Suja, just took 90 million from Coca-Cola, that packaging is all about transparency. They also adopted the fact that there is gonna be settling in a product, which most consumers probably aren't gonna like at first, but you can't un un unlearn something, and so consumers are now fine with that. And so they really pushed the envelope on the industry. If we look at our food counterparts, Boom Chicka Pop came into the popped popcorn category and everyone was showing pictures of popcorn. Who here doesn't know what popcorn looks like? And so they decided to take a stance, not show the product on their uh, front of pack, and really own a tone of voice. And as a result, they're one of the leaders in the category today. So now let's talk about why you guys should invest in design. James Thompson, Chief Marketing Officer of Diageo, one of Lars Spears holding companies, had this to say at a recent trade show event. Design is integrated into a company when you don't get asked about the return on investment. The second you start asking about numbers in and then numbers out, it's the second that you've already lost. This should not be about a business transaction. This is much larger. 
here's what your return on investment is going to look like. It's getting a consumer to spend their hard-earned dollars on your brand, signing a check in 2016. Um, and it's also about uh, the emotional um, benefit you give to a consumer. It's getting people to opt into your brand, to make it a part of their life, to, to help improve the way that they feel throughout their day. That is going to be your return on investment. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about um, you know, a couple of reasons of why you should invest in design. I'm going to give you four. Here's the first one. It's understanding that your brand is greater than your product. This guy is all about private label. People are practical about products and commodities. People are emotional about brands. This guy loves his favorite cold brew, his favorite kombucha, his fixed gear bicycle, whatever it is. He's willing to spend five times the amount on a brand that he cares about than the same product done from a private label. You want to build a brand. You don't want to just simply move goods. And understanding that who you are is greater than what you are. A product and a commodity just tells you what it is. Brands tell you who they are and why they exist. So we're going to look at an example. Coconut water. This is a brand that operates under the guise of a commodity. The first thing you see is coconut juice. It tells you exactly what it is. The second thing you see, coconuts what it is. Only maybe the third or fourth uh, piece of communication in the hierarchy is the brand. They just want to move product. And any time a private label goes on sale next to them, all of a sudden they're susceptible to price wars. You guys don't want to do that. And the biggest mistake a lot of you guys will do is just tell what you are, because it's the easiest thing. I know what that is. It's simple. A who will always beat a what. Vitacoco takes a stance. And granted, it was the first to the category. So it's all about sort of refreshment and Brazilian lifestyle and, and things of that nature. But a who is also going to help you compete against other who's. And so now Zico comes into the market and they look like an escapist sort of brand. It's about relaxation, modern, lifestyle, premium. And you have two very different sets of consumer bases now. And people are going to make a choice when they walk to the shelf for the very first time. The second reason to invest in design is understanding the power of your promise. And a brand can be broken down into a simple formula. I'm going to spell it out here for you guys. Your promise plus your ability to follow through on that promise equals your brand. Or in other words, your presentation, judging a book by its cover, what you look like on shelf, plus the experience equals your brand. Now, you cannot have an amazing presentation and a poor experience because you'll get onto shelf once and people will no longer buy you after the first trial. You can build a brand with an amazing experience and a poor presentation. And I'm going to show you two examples of that. Tito's Vodka. I don't know if any of you guys have ever had it. It's unreal. It's really, really good. It also looks like it's been distilled once in a garage. Um, Almond Breeze, again, it kind of operates like a commodity. It tells you what it is. It's got a conventional pour. It's very straightforward and boring. Now, these are brands that have amazing experiences. The product inside of these packages is great. And they can validate those few people that can get through all of the hurdles to want to eventually try it. But when you have so much competition around you, what's going to make you pick these ones up? The best brands in the world are built with a strong presentation and an even better experience. Hanson Sonoma. This is a great vodka. This is a company that launched um, went to the San Francisco Liquor Festival, or excuse me, not Liquor Festival, but um, Spirits competition, and they won four gold medals. Now it looks like it's been distilled like 87 times. It looks handcrafted, artisanal, and yet you don't see any of that sort of cliche marketing terms uh, on the pack. It just looks premium. You almost want to buy that. Califia Farms doesn't tell you just simply what it is. It tells you who it is. It takes a stance. It's a brand about uh, clean ingredients. Purity, sleek bottle, it almost begs to be taken out of the fridge and put out so that other people can see you with it. That is the reason why you should invest in your promise. Social currency. This is a beverage conference. I think we all love beverages, but there's a really interesting reason why beverages out of the food and beverage world 
become lifestyle brands. You don't see Twinkies being a lifestyle brand. When you go home, when you go shopping, you buy food, you put it away in your cupboards, it's never seen by anyone. Beverages are inherently portable. And as a result, you carry them around with you and they start to say something about you. Celebrities are paid to endorse things, but what's even better is a duck face selfie with a bottle of kombucha. You want people to be so passionate about your brands that they're willing to post it on their forms of social media. Understanding that the beverage that I hold in my hand is just as important as the car I drive or the watch on my wrist or the shoes on my feet. It says something about you. If I'm holding a rock star right now, you guys are gonna think I didn't even sleep last night and I was clubbing my face off. But if I hold a Red Bull in my hands, you're gonna think I get after it during the week and that maybe I like to relax on the weekends. They say two very different things about you. And whether you realize it or not, you make it a statement about yourself with what you hold in your hand. You need to create brands that people want to be seen with, that people opt into. It's important to, to know that what you say your brand is, is irrelevant. It's what consumers tell each other it is. It's the same reason why PBR all of a sudden got popular. PBR wasn't saying it was cool. Hipsters in New York took it over, people were admiring hipsters, and then it spreads like wildfire. It's because people adopted and hijacked brands, and your brand is going to get hijacked in the market. Most of the time you can craft it so that your messaging is what the consumer takes on and spreads. Lastly, life after demoing. A lot of you guys are gonna start out in stores doing this 24 seven, and it's incredibly important that you do that because you're gonna learn a lot. You're gonna learn what people don't like, you're gonna learn what people do like, you're gonna learn a lot. But if you have any hope of getting outside of your local stores, you're gonna need a, to build a brand and packaging that sells itself so that you don't have to work as hard. You're gonna need to tell a story. You're gonna need to engage consumers at shelf. If you can get someone to pick up your product, they are so much more likely to buy it. You need to engage with consumers emotionally. All of the big beverage companies in the world, they have advertising, they have PR firms, they have social media experts, all of this stuff goes into help crafting that world of their brand. You guys have one sales tool. It is your packaging. And when people see you at shelf for the first time, that's gonna be everything that they know and understand. But the great thing here is, is that the shelf is the great equalizer. I'm gonna come with a need state, and then I'm gonna look out at the set, and I'm gonna see what emotionally resonates with me. This is your opportunity. This is a level playing field. This is something you can compete on. And it's important in investing in that. So just to give you guys the three keys, it's about finding your partner. Understanding the sooner you can invest in design, the better. Assess your needs. Find out what's right for you at the appropriate time and get personal. Amplify your relationship. Understand yourself. Set your objectives. What is success to you? And have, be brave and trust. No one wants another Me Too brand have faith in being different. And lastly, invest in design. Your brand is greater than your product, the power of a promise, social currency, and life after demo. And just to wrap this all up, Michael Beirut, one of the best design thinkers in the world, has this to say, you are not guaranteed success, you're guaranteed potential. Just because you invest in design doesn't mean you're going to be successful. There are a million things that have to happen. You have to have the right co-packer, the right product, the right manufacturer, the right distributor, all of these things, the right key retailers. Investing in design is about mitigating risk and increasing your odds of success. There's a lot of potential in this room. Let's see who can tap it best. Thank you. That was outstanding. Thanks so much, Fred. All right, so I am sure that there are questions in the audience. Anyone? <laughs> Maybe I was wrong. Maybe it was such a concise presentation that uh, they were so. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, one of the points you brought up was about, you know, you're not guaranteed success. Right. Um, so if you're not guaranteed success, then, you, you know, how do you measure retarded investment? Right, right. I think, again, it goes back to that ROI slide. It's about getting people to care enough that they're willing to spend their hard-earned money on your product. And the best way to do that is by emotionally resonating with consumers. At the end of the day, what, we are not simply moving our products, but we're in the business of emotion. And I think that's the best way to invest in a product, is to put something out into the world that makes people feel a certain way. Um, and hopefully a, a way that people want to feel. Um, OK. Yeah. OK, we have a question in the back. Hi, 
there. Thank you for an informative presentation. <laughs> You're um, welcome. I was wondering, in the design process, have you or how have you involved customers as part of either a redesign, a launch? How are you kind of gathering? Because there's the founder's vision and there's the market where the founder sees it going, but then what about the customers and the, gauging the reactions of the customer before launching the new brand? Great question. So. Uh, it stems from my sort of earlier point about our work. Our job is not to win design awards, right? It's, it's to resonate with people. It's people at the end of the day make your brand. They're gonna hijack and tell others what they think about it. Uh, the importance of bravery is something to definitely keep in mind. Uh, there's a great Ford quote about when he was creating the, the car, the first car. Uh, if he had asked people what he wanted, people would have said a faster horse. Right, and so you can't always rely on what people want because they'll just tell you what they already know. Um, certain clients we have, like we just worked with Dogfish Head, Big Craft Brewery, and we brought consumers into the brand framework and co-creation sessions and a strategy to make sure that we maintained uh, their equities, that they were recognizable to date. But it wasn't asking them what it should look like or why we should exist or what we should hang our hats on. So it, you have to be very careful. I think you never want too many cooks in the kitchen, and that's what consumers will give you. Um, when you start your brand year one to year five, you're gonna go through a lot of change. Some changes will be more dramatic, some will be more evolutionary. You're gonna learn a lot just from being out in the marketplace, so it's best not to cater to what people want in the beginning. I think it's always going to be easier to adjust closer to you know, the center of what people want than to start there. You're never gonna learn as much. Um, I have a question here. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. One of the things that you pointed out and um, it really struck home to me and I had a follow up on it was when you're on your package, you really want to hone in and be able to say one thing about who we are and planting your flag. What's your advice um, of finding that? What are the exercises you do to really figure out what that's going to be? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think you need to bring to the table what you think is that, is that one thing. Um, any good design partner is going to help challenge you and to make sure that it's differentiated from the marketplace and that, to the last person's question, that it matters to people. Because just because you're different for the sake of being different doesn't mean it's gonna do anything for you. Um, exercises to help you kind of figure out who you are. Um, the, like I said, the easiest thing is going to be able to tell people what you are, right? Then there's a layer of who you are, who is your brand, what is your perspective on the world, and then why do you do what you do? And I think that last question, why do you do what you do, why are you even creating this product, is going to be the most important thing you can bring to the table. Your design partner will help tease apart what's important and what's not, and, and which parts to amplify. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question, but we can talk later and I might have some more specifics. Indeed, Fred is going to be one of the table captains uh, after our break, so if you have more questions for him, please see him. But for right now, another round of applause. For fantastic cool. Thank questions. you.